Thank you, Emilio. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, this is joint work with Stephen Checkaway of Oberlin College and Hov Afshasham of UT Austin. In this talk, I'll be showing you one possible way that a decoder vulnerability can take you from playing a video to getting a crash. So who is this talk for and why? This talk is first for red teamers that are looking for a new attack surface to explore. Alongside them, this is relevant to blue teams as they identify their threat models. Similarly, policymakers may care as they assess the risk to their respective institutions. And this is also relevant to developers that work with compressed videos. In fact, this talk is for anyone that plays arbitrary videos. For example, I am someone who plays arbitrary videos. And who am I? My, my name is Willie Vasquez, and I go by WERV. I'm a PhD student at UT Austin. I do research in system security, cryptography, and cyber law and policy, and I was previously at MIT and BBN. And you can check out my website there to see the kind of adventures I get into. So going back to arbitrary videos. Arbitrary videos from untrusted sources are everywhere. As you scroll the web, videos from websites or ads may automatically start playing. Even more concerning, strangers can send you videos through messaging apps, which your device processes. So why is this exposure to videos from untrusted sources an issue? This is because processing arbitrary videos is dangerous. As an example, messaging apps will produce a thumbnail for the notification, which can enable zero-click attacks, meaning you may not realize you've been hacked. User applications, the kernel, and dedicated hardware each parse different parts of the video, providing a deep attack surface. And existing defenses rarely focus on video decoding issues at the kernel or hardware level. The danger partly comes from the fact that videos are compressed with complex algorithms called codecs, of which H.264 is the most universally supported codec, with practically all devices having H.264 decode support. This ubiquity and complexity leads to a vast and underexplored attack surface. To explore this attack surface, we introduce H.264Forge, a tool that produces specially crafted videos to test H.264 decoders for vulnerabilities, so that once vulnerabilities are found, they can be extinguished. With H.264Forge, we found and reported issues in applications, kernel drivers, and hardware. Given all this, in this talk, I'll first show the complexity of video decoding and demonstrate the decoder attack surface, especially how it relates to H.264 encoded videos. Then I'll introduce our new tool called H.264Forge, a toolkit to produce specially crafted videos to find vulnerabilities in video decoders and investigate their exploitability. Finally, I'll show you how we used H.264Forge to find and investigate serious vulnerabilities in the iOS kernel, because if even Apple can have these issues, others can as well. Before starting, I want to share that H.264Forge is currently available if you want to start playing with it during this talk. If you don't feel comfortable scanning a QR code from the Black Hat stage, it's totally fine, understand. You can type in that URL and check out our tool. OK, let's start now by looking at the video attack surface. The threat model that we're working under is an adversary crafting a malicious video and getting the video to play on a victim device. This could be accomplished either via putting the video up on a website and having the user play the video or have the system generate a thumbnail, or alternatively, by sending the video to a victim directly through a messaging app. Once the video arrives at the victim, often in a container format such as MP4, the video decoding pipeline starts with a user application parsing the MP4 metadata. The user application then forwards the encoded bitstream to a kernel driver, which will parse a portion of it to prepare dedicated hardware for decoding. This dedicated hardware receives the rest of the encoded bitstream and produces the individual frames that we see. The reason that we have this dedicated hardware is because decoding is a computation computationally heavy process, so this hardware ensures smooth video playback. In fact, in the course of this work, we identified over 25 different providers of H.264 hardware video decoders. These are built into the system on chip and GPU that your device uses, and it's not always easy to identify which decoder it's using. And each hardware video decoder has its own kernel driver associated with, to, associated with it to control it. So what each decoder kernel driver does is it takes untrusted input from the internet, 
parses part of the video in the kernel and finally sends the rest to hardware to produce frames, surely nothing can go wrong here. Well, let me tell you about the Apple mobile video decoder and what went, what went wrong. Apple has had two mobile hardware video decoders that we're aware of. The first is the Apple D5500, found in devices with up to A11 SOCs. It is built by Imagination Technologies and has its own kernel driver, the Apple D5500 Kex, or kernel extension associated with it. The second is Apple's own video decoder called Apple AVD, which was introduced in A12 SOCs and M1 Macs, and also with its own kernel driver. And even though they both decode H.264 videos, after staring at both for a long time in Ghidra, we found that they don't share a lot of code. So what can go wrong with these devices? We can get a kernel panic, or in other words, a path to privilege escalation on Apple devices. During this research, we identified three parsing vulnerabilities in the Apple D5500 video decoding pipeline, one of which we showed to be zero click and two to be triggerable via thumbnailing. While working on H.264, we were also gifted with an amazing case study about an in-the-wild vulnerability exploiting Apple AVD. And while the root cause analysis was identified, it was not known how it was exploited because there was no sample available. So in this research, we demonstrated an exploitation path to get a heap overflow. For this talk, though, I'll just be describing CVE 2022-32939, a controlled kernel heap write that is triggerable via thumbnailing, and we defer to the paper for now for details on how we exploited Apple AVD. Before we dive into what exactly went wrong and how to exploit this vulnerability, let me tell you a bit about the H.264 codec itself. H.264, or the Advanced Video Codec, was standardized in 2003 by the ITU and the, Moving, and the Moving Picture Experts Group, or MPEG. Because of this, it has two names, H.264 and AVC, but we just stick to H.264 in this talk. And the spec itself is over 800 pages how to, describing how to decode video, or go from a compressed bitstream to the frames that we see. And we chose to study H.264 because it's supported on practically all modern devices. So now I'll discuss how the bitstream representation of the H.264 codec works. This is background info for understanding the vulnerabilities that we discovered and analyzed. If you get lost, don't worry. I'll be doing a review when we get to the vulnerabilities part. So as I mentioned before, videos arrive in a container format, such as MP4. To extract the encoded video, we can run an FFmpeg command like this. And once we have the encoded video, now we can begin to identify some patterns. First, let's, uh, we see the sequence of zeros followed by a one. These are called start codes, and what they do is identify the beginning of an H.264 sequence. These sequences are called network abstraction layer units, or NALUs. So now let me rearrange this bitstream to begin by start code. And here, the first byte of each now you is its header. And the last five bits of the header specify the now you type. So now I'll get rid of the start codes and we're just looking at the types. And the only thing that, um, the key thing to, to remember here is that uh, type seven and eight, these are called parameter sets and they're used to set up the decoder and five and one are slices, which are the actual compressed video frames. Looking at the rest of the now you, these contain what are called syntax elements. So the syntax elements are the language of H.264 and are what actually get parsed out of the bitstream. This is a screenshot of the H.264 spec showing how the bitstream should be parsed for picture parameter sets. The pseudocode is read from top to bottom and it also details the bitstream representation for each value and each bolded, bolded item is a syntax element. Now, each syntax element has what it's called a semantics associated with it. The semantics specify how the syntax element is to be used by the decoder, and also the expected range that the syntax element should take on. In this case, we see that numslice groups minus one has its expected range pointing to another part of the 800 page spec. So now, not only is the value that each syntax element is used to, uh, used to recover frames, but it's also used to continue decoding the bitstream. Here we see that a non-zero num slice groups minus one leads to a different parsing condition of the bitstream. So in order to properly and robustly decode a video, a decoder must implement both syntax and semantics checking. This means that the decoder needs to update the syntax element pseudocode 
with a check for the maximum possible value that it could take on. So how can we check if decoders implement semantic checks or not? What we could do is try to modify the bitstream directly and see what happens. I'll show you an example. To show you the fragility of the bitstream representation, the, this is the opening sequence from last year's Black Cat Talks found on YouTube. And here's a portion of its bitstream. And we take this 33 and just increment it to 34, just flip a couple bits. And whenever we play the video, we see that we get this completely different output, this like red, or it's, you can still see the shape there, but the, it's flipping a couple bits leads to this unpredictable output. And if we increment it to 35, now we see this like green, blue uh, color scheme. So from a security perspective, if we want to test out the syntax element values, we'd like it to be syntactically correct, meaning that the bit stream is correctly read, but semantically non-compliant, meaning the syntax elements are out of bounds. I also want to point out here that for the rest of this talk, every time you see a box with a pink dashed line, that is a screenshot from the spec referring to syntax elements, and blue dotted refers to the semantics. So we're not actually the first to have identified issues in H.264 decoders. Donenfeld in this RAC article describes a vulnerability in H.264 decoding of the Apple D5500. In Black Hat 2019, Gong presented on issues found in Qualcomm's hardware video decoder. Last fall, Terakonov and Labunets presented a deep dive on Hexacon, uh, at Hexacon on Apple AVD. And Natalie Silvanovich of Google Project Zero has found many issues in Apple AVD. A particular interest is CVE 2022-22675, an Apple in the wild O-Day that was analyzed by Little Lilo and Binary Boy, as well as Natalie Silvanovich. So this CVE is an in the wild Apple kernel O-Day, and while the threat actor, actor information was not shared, it is believed to be part of an exploit chain on Mac OS with an Intel graphics driver information leak. And because it impacts Apple AVD, it also impacts iOS. The root cause analysis performed by Natalie Silvanovich found that the CBP count minus one syntax element was missing a bounds check. This syntax element is used as a loop bound to write values into a fixed sized array which lives on the kernel heap. And according to the spec, the CBP count minus one should be in the range of zero to 31. So the size of each array in Apple AVD was 32. So because we know that the CVE was exploited in the wild, there must be some way for this, to, this heap overflow to lead to a crash. So our expectation is that we just set CBB count minus one to its maximum possible value and get a crash. The real ad, reality is that this was quite painful, as little Lilo and Natalie Silvanovich discuss in this thread. This is because there are no good tools available. Here, Natalie Silvanovich describes that she had to forge the file bit by bit and that it was terrible. There are two key challenges faced when trying to modify syntax elements by hand. The first is the variable bit length representation. So let's look at setting that single CBB count minus one value. Here are some possible out of, bound, out of bound values that it could take on alongside its binary representation. And we can see that the, because the encoding is always an odd number of bits, it's not enough to just pop this in a hex editor easily and begin inserting some bits. Furthermore, incrementing the values means that we need to adjust the bit string for dependent syntax elements. So we observe that doing this by hand at scale is infeasible and argue that a lack of tooling is holding back security professionals. Before showcasing how we overcome these challenges, let me just summarize what we've seen. First is that video decoding, including thumbnailing, is done in kernel drivers and dedicated hardware. Second is that H.264 bitstreams are divided into network abstraction layer units, or NALUs. Third is that syntax elements have associated semantics, but those semantics are not always enforced. And finally, we showed that mod modifying syntax elements is currently a challenging process. So now I'll introduce H.264Forge, a toolkit to help researchers create specially crafted H.264 videos. With H.264Forge, we can programmatically edit H.264 syntax elements with Python scripts. So previously, creating the CBB count minus one video was a pain. Now it's just a few lines of Python. Here we set it to its maximum possible value and update the dependent syntax element arrays. 
Looking at H.264 overall, it is a toolkit to manipulate H.264 syntax elements. It's written in over 30,000 lines of Rust and took three years to develop. And so what it does is abstract out the bitstream representation so that you don't have to worry about individual bits that are set. It will parse the encoded bitstream and maintain the syntax elements in memory. At which point, we can mo programmatically modify them with Python scripts uh, called video transforms, as shown previously. And in fact, we can ignore an input and instead generate random inputs with syntax elements sampled from a provided range. H.264 can then output the encoded bitstream directly or as part of an MP4 container. So looking at the CBP count minus one and its dependent syntax elements, we can just pass in the range for it that we want in order to generate videos that are out of bounds. And then we can also uh, create videos with fun looking frames such as this one. Using H.264's video generation capabilities, we were able to find vulnerabilities in video players, kernel extensions, and hardware. Here we see a Firefox out of bounds read vulnerability that is visible from the recovered frames and a hardware information leak that we discovered. While the details for each of these are in the paper, I only have enough time to tell you about one. Let's now dive into CVE 2022-32939, an iOS kernel heap write vulnerability discovered with H.264's video generation. We used three key tools in this analysis. First, Keydraw was used for static analysis of the kernel video decoder. Corellium was used for kernel debugging and testing on different iOS versions. And finally, of course, proof of concept videos were generated with H.264. So this vulnerability is one of the three we found in the Apple D5500 text. And what this vulnerability is, is a heap overflow from a missing bounce check from emulation prevention byte handling, which I will explain in just a bit. It was found with H.264's video generation capabilities, and what we did is just generate batches of 100 videos, transfer them onto the device, and just saw what happened. And we found the device crash and rebooted. This heap overflow allows for an iOS kernel controlled heap write vulnerability, though to properly exploit it, we need to chain it with an information leak. And this issue is triggerable from video thumbnailing, which is a zero-click attack surface. And it was patched in these iOS and iPadOS versions. So going back to emulation prevention bytes, recall that the H.264 bitstream is split into now use with start code. And so an issue is, what if this sequence shows up inside of a now you? The solution is to use emulation prevention bytes. And what this is, is just inserting an escape character into the stream. So now the sequence of zeros uh, fo uh, before, uh, followed by a one because it now gets escaped with uh, a three right there. And you do this for a certain set of patterns found in the bitstream. Later on, once the now use are organized by start code, the EPBs are removed and you can parse the video correctly. So now let's look to see how the Apple D5500 text handles EPBs. Here we have a now you that has many EPBs that must be removed in order to parse the bitstream correctly. For some reason that we're not entirely sure of, uh, the bitstream parser heap object keeps track of the bit offset it sees each EBP in a UN array of 256 elements and maintains the count of EPBs that it has seen immediately after at memories. So as the decoder is scanning the incoming stream four bytes at a time, once it finds an EPB, it jots down the bit offset it found it at and increments the count. One thing that I want to point out here is that the EPB's variable, this, this count, also serves as an index to the array, which will become important in a bit. So it removes it from the bitstream and it uh, increments the count. So now let's look to see what happens at the 256th EPB. Its bit position B will be stored, and the count slash pointer will be incremented, and it'll be removed, but there's no bounce check going on. So now the count is pointing to itself. So what will happen at the 257th EPV? Its bit position will be calculated, and it will overwrite our count with the bit offset. So now our index is pointing somewhere off into memory. The EPB is removed, and all would be okay if we stop now, but we're not done. 
Now we have the 258th EBB at position Q. And its position, bit position is calculated using the overwritten value and is stored at the overwritten inde index. At this point, it's game over. Boom, we have a panic. So for generating a POC video, the Apple D5500 Kex needs a valid long now you with at least 258 EPBs. Because if it detects any decoding errors, then it will stop early and not fill up the EPB buffer. In order to generate this video, we found a target in the parameter set parsing that can generate large sign 32-bit values, such that their encoding would generate tons of emulation prevention bytes. Here's the video transform used that will set each uh, offset for ref frame to a large negative value and generate 514 EPBs. So let me show you now how to generate this video. Here again is the transform that I just showed you that will trigger our vulnerability. It sets the offset for ref frame and generates 514 EPBs. And looking at our input, we see that it's pretty small and there are no EPBs. We run H.264 Forge, and it, to generate the video, and we can see that it provides us the value that will get written at a particular index. And now looking at our, our output, we see that there are a bunch of EPBs everywhere. So here I'm showing you a physical iPhone SE with iOS 13.3. Now I'm opening the Files app, which will generate a thumbnail for any videos in the folder. And now I will transfer the video that we just generated with iTunes. Once it arrives, we see that iTunes got disconnected from the phone, which just went all black. And we now see the Apple Start logo, indicating a phone reboot due to a panic. So let's summarize now what we've seen with the CVE. The root cause was a missing bounds check for writing into the EPB array. This was fixed by just adding a bounds check for the count. The location of the 257th EPB lets us control where we write, and the location of the 258th EPB lets us control what we write. Though to bitstream re restrictions, we're limited to small and negative 32-bit values. But if we don't get a crash, then each subsequent EPB after the 258th will allow for a continuous overwrite. In order to exploit this vulnerability for, say, a privilege escalation, you need a validly encoded bitstream, uh, at least 258 EPBs, and an information leak vulnerability to know what to target. And note that I didn't describe here how one would get an info leak. Though, once you have a target, you can use H.264 to tailor the location of EPBs 257 and 258. So now, to conclude. I showed you that the decoder uh, complexity is significant and that video decoding attack surface is difficult to explore. In looking at the codec threat landscape, there are some risks and concerns. The first, that as noted with the in the wild Apple AVD bug, there are actors out there abusing this attack vector that may have tools like H.264 already. Second is that defenses are sparse at the codec level. While there has been much work done to protect video container parsing after the 2015 Android stage fright vulnerabilities, much of the codec parsing happens at lower levels, which are still vulnerable. As an individual, you can try to disable automatic video thumbnailing or autoplaying on the web, as well as disabling videos that come from individuals you do not know. But not all is forsaken. There are some positive directions as well. The first is the Stateless Video Decoder Initiative by the Video for Linux folks, which aims to remove syntax element parsing from the Linux kernel. And second is that we're getting per more performant software decoding, meaning that vulnerabilities can be isolated with sandboxing te technologies like RLbox. I also shared how we found some serious iOS kernel vulnerabilities and described one that provided a a controlled kernel heap write capability. I only presented a parser bug that caused the memory corruption, but we found some other issues as well, such as device denial of service from undefined states or information leakage vulnerabilities, such as from the, a browser graphics processing library. And some of these issues were zero clickable. To solve, and finally, to solve these challenges, I introduced H.264. So the key takeaway is that special tools like H.264 Forge can help make sense of the complexity of encoded video and to discover vulnerabilities in this underexplored attack surface. Going forward, we would like to see more codecs evaluated in a similar fashion. 
We started with H.264 because of its ubiquity, but there are many other codecs with dedicated hardware that could suffer from similar issues. While we have focused on user devices, there is server infrastructure that does operations like video transcoding that may also suffer from these types of issues. And building off this work, we can all H.264 forge a new path forward to secure video infrastructure. Some potential directions include pushing for user available system on chip bombs akin to the SBOM effort so that users can identify the potential hardware risks. Integrating tools like H.264 forge into, their, into your own secure software development cycle to test projects that work with codecs early on and building more memory-safe video decoders, potentially atop H.264's 30,000 lines of rust. So to finish up, the attack surface of video decoders is underexplored by security researchers. Tools like H.264 help unlock this space, hack the planet. Our code and paper are available, and I, and I, and I will now take any questions here or in the wrap room. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you for the great talk. I was just curious, so uh, you were talking about some uh, vulnerabilities that you have discovered or uh, uh, yeah, vulnerabilities that you have or bugs that you have discovered in the, I believe, the difference between the codec specification and the codec implementation. Mm -hmm. But uh, is it also possible that the codec itself could have a, a bug or a vulnerability? I mean, you said that, it, it, that the, it's 800 pages long, right, the manual, so it's possible that there could be something. Has there been any uh, any previous vulnerability found in the H.264 itself? That's a good question. Uh, we didn't have a chance to look at all 800 pages, so it's, there's, it's possible that the spec may have some inconsistencies and potential issues embedded in it itself. Thank you. Thanks. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone.